Greetings to everybody. We're going to have another sermon here, and this is going to be a series of sermons. One of our members requested we have a lesson on the home and family, and I have thought about it, and to put it all into one 30-minute sermon would be impossible to cover the details like we should. So we're going to have a series of lessons on raising a godly family in an ungodly world. Well, we preface this by saying this world is not uh, friendly towards Christians. This world is not friendly towards God. And this world is set itself to do evil, all sorts of evil. And this is nothing new. Remember in the days of Noah, God looked and saw that the, the thoughts of man were evil continuously. And for most men, most women, that is their case. They, they want to fulfill the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. And they don't like anybody telling them that they shouldn't do that. So therefore, they hate religion. They hate God. They hate anybody that tells them they shouldn't be living the lifestyle they've chosen to live. And so when we think that the family unit is God's appointed plan for the proliferation of mankind, we, we need to just understand that uh, raising a godly family is going to take some effort on our part. <laughs> so I'm going to get into this, the PowerPoint slideshow here, and we're going to talk about that. All right. All right. A godly family in an ungodly world. And so uh, we talk about building godly relationships. Uh, we uh, just finished a Sunday morning class study about two and a half years of building godly relationships and doing having relationships that God would be pleased with. And so we need to look at the home as God would have it and what it should be there. And of course, uh, we're going to notice some things about this. If I can get it start responding. And it's not responding for me. There we go. Okay. Remember in jo Joshua 24, 15, he made the statement, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And why did he have to make that statement? Well, because many of his, uh, his family, many of his kinsmen had decided they wanted to worship other gods. They wanted to worship the gods of the uh, inhabitants of the land. And they wanted to serve the gods of Egypt that were there. And they weren't satisfied to worship the Lord God. And so Joshua said, well, y'all do what you want, make up your mind. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that's a proper thing to say. And that's what every family should be willing to say. Now, reality says it does not happen that way. See, whether you're single with or without children or married with or without children, see, God is always concerned about your family. It's the people that you dwell with, the people that you spend time with, uh, the, the people that uh, you should care about more than anything else. And so he's concerned about your family. And it's the most important building block to human society. And therefore, it should be nurtured and protected. We know that's not the case these days with our, our current world. And so we have to take this warning also. Sometimes we learn these things too late in life, and it's nearly impossible to rectify. Some people don't become Christians until later in life, and then they, they would like to see their family members obey the gospel, but they're just not ready. They haven't been conditioned for it, and they're just not ready, and they choose not to do it. And it's sad for the parents uh, when that happens. Sometimes children obey the gospel, and they want to see their parents saved. And so they, they talk to them about it and invite them to examine the evidence of the Bible, things like that. And sometimes it's just too late because people get into their ruts. People get into their routines. And as we've said before, people hate change. I mean, to change anything is something we don't like. We despise it, and we eventually get used to it. But 
uh, we despise it. Now, in these last days, we know Satan has launched an all out attack on the family union. And so what does he do? By attempting to change the definition of marriage, uh, to bringing divisions within our family units as a whole. This world is definitely not conducive for a family that fears the Lord. He has no problem with the fornication that causes uh, children to be born outside of wedlock. And uh, of course, uh, we know in recent years uh, that uh, the definition of marriage has been defined by the courts and then redefined by the courts based on public or popular opinion. See, they change. And so the, the, the reality is that a lot of groups, they think it's a uh, very, uh, it's kind of anti-politically correct to talk about a mother and father. I mean, we should be talking about children's mommy and mommy and daddy and daddy, but mommy and daddy, oh no, that, that's just terrible. That's horrible. That, that, that kind of puts a stigma or kind of offends somebody who doesn't have a mommy and daddy. I mean, you see where, where we're going with this. See, nevertheless, in spite of what is going on in the world around us, it is still possible to have a godly family in an ungodly world. All right, but the thing is, it takes effort. We have to work at it. And it just doesn't come by uh, routine or just by exposure. We've got to work at it. All right, so what, what's this involved? See, the next few months or the next few lessons, it's going to be talking about lessons that are designed to help us develop and maintain families and households that are Christ-centered and spirit-filled. How do we do that? Well, we're going to talk about that. And these lessons are meant to help us create family units that will withstand the ungodly pressure that is causing many households to collapse today. You know, divorce. I mean, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. And of course, that number is going down simply because a lot of people go cohabit without the, uh, the, the license or without the marriage. And so, of course, that God calls that fornication. And so that's just as wrong. And uh, they, they sometimes have raised family units in these situations of fornication. And so households are collapsing. As a result of households collapsing, our society is collapsing. 60, 70, or two or three generations ago, families were considered to be of supreme importance to uh, the whole of society but then they started rebelling against God and they started removing um, the nuclear family as we should be aware of. So in addition to these lessons, I'm gonna be challenging each family to take steps to fortify their own family structure against the wiles of the devil. Yes, what we know about the devil is the fact that he wants to keep you out of heaven. So if he can disrupt anything in your life that goes against God, he's going to help you do that. And of course, when you do things that go against God, you have a chance that you're going to lose your soul. And that's what the devil wants. All right. The first challenge is to evaluate your household for areas where your family may be vulnerable for attack by the enemy. And this is very easy. I mean, we, we understand the need for preparation. When a storm is impending, we're advised to do a walkthrough, make sure our house is secure. Uh, sometimes if you're in the areas where there might be a hurricane, you, you have the boards ready and, and you, you put the boards over the windows and you, you tape the windows and you do all sorts of safety measures for preparation. And um, so, and many experts suggest a family meeting to discuss just in case scenarios. What happens if your house is blown away and you have surviving family members? Where do you meet? Uh, uh, who do you call? Where can you go? So just things like that to have a plan in place. Uh, here in California, there might be a, a big earthquake and uh, a lot of things disrupted. Of course, the communications would be disrupted. You just can't jump on your cell phone and call 
uh, your family members. So where do you go? What do you do? How do you get in touch with them? These are things that need to be discussed in any family. All right, so, but the same is also true for our families. I mean, we have to understand what do we do in the case of this or that? All right, we can start off, we begin by evaluating our family's relationship with God. And we should, yes. Do, do we have a good relationship with God? Are we in good standing with God? How do we know we're in good standing with God? Not just because we say we believe, but because we obey, we obey his commands. And so that's how we maintain our relationship with God. And you ask the question, is God a part of your family? I mean, do, does God take precedence when we make decisions as a family? Do we consider how this plays in our relationship with God? It should, you know, when we decide on vacations and things like that, we can make all these plans of going to Disneyland or, go, or going some other amusement park and doing rides. But if you don't plan on the Lord's day to be with the saints, at least somewhere, all right, God is not a part of your family. And a lot of families, they, they choose their destination where they're going to go. And then after they get there, they look around to see if they can find a church. And believe me, you can find a lot of surprises when you do that if you don't plan ahead. So is the word of God regularly read and taught in your household? I mean, it should be. I mean, his are the words of life, right? That's what Jesus said. His words are eternal life. Uh, John 12 verse 50 tells us that. So uh, is it taught regularly in your household? And does your family worship and pray together at home? I mean, nowadays, to find somebody who actually sits around a table and says grace right before they eat. I mean, that's kind of a rare occasion for a lot of people. It's usually one family member comes in, pops something in the microwave and goes, sits down to eat. Another family member comes in and then fixes something to eat. Uh, maybe a few hours later, somebody else shows up. And then, of course, they grab their food and they run to their bedroom. They run to the, the living room to watch TV or or run outside to enjoy the weather. I mean, spending time with each other, that's so important. And so another thing to consider is your family exposed to music that is godly. I mean, if you're listening to what they play over the radio waves, it's not godly. Uh, very little uh, good, clean entertainment comes across the radio waves and the, and the music scene, uh, movies. Yeah, there's movies which talk about uh, uh, spiritual things, but they usually have era mixed in with them. And so they're, they're, they're teaching things that are not correct. When it comes to movies about Bible subjects, honestly, there are very, very few that even come close to portraying what the Bible actually says. You know, a lot of our movies that have been made about like Noah and Moses and others they were put together by atheists who wanted to make a mockery of what the Bible said. And people somehow, they think, oh, this is the Bible subject. Here, let me learn about Noah. And they learn all this falsehood. And yet they think they know about Noah now. All right. So uh, we have to be very careful with what we read. And even what we call Christian writings, sometimes they don't teach the whole story. And that leaves out part of the counsel of God. And so what effect do your companions have on your spiritual condition? And what effect do you have upon others in your family about their spiritual condition? Do we build each other up or do we just basically show them that we're nothing more than a hypocrite? All right. Now, the question, does Jesus live here? Here's a story I ran across many years ago. So there's a story about a wife speaking to her husband when he got home. She'd been busy with the kids and chores and running errands. And she said that during the day, someone came and knocked on the door and asked the question, does Jesus live here? She said this bothered her very much and she had been thinking about it all day. And she now wonders herself, does Jesus live here? And she asked her husband, well, does he? Well, think about this. See, if the answer is no to any of these questions, 
then it's time to make some adjustments. That, that ought to be a little bit of common sense there. And so the stronger the presence and power of God is in your household, the less power the devil has to enter in to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the enemy does. Jesus said, John 10, 9, that's what he's about. Jesus said, I came to bring life and life more abundantly there in John 10 and verse 10. And so when we have a strong relationship with God, Satan's power is not very conducive to influencing you to do evil. So that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to have that power for, for us to give him that power so we can turn our back on God. And if we can ignore our family members and not encourage them to be faithful, then that's what the devil likes. He likes things like that. See, a godly family depends on a sure foundation. See, we need to make a commitment today to develop a God-centered household by making sure our relationship with the Lord is what it ought to be and infusing the things of God into the daily function and routines of your family. I mean, it should be there. So in Matthew 7, 24, Jesus saying, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And then, so one of the things we, that we have learned in experience and studies and practice is that whether or not a structure like a house will stand is really determined largely by the foundation on which it is built. And we know that's true. If the foundation or the ground upon which that foundation is laid is weak, then no matter how beautiful or fortified the building may look, it is only a matter of time before the forces of time and nature will cause that building to collapse. Sometimes it happens right away, sometimes it happens over time. I mean, a good example, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I mean, they, they thought they had a nice, pretty tower, then all of a sudden it started leaning and leaning and leaning. And before long, they had to start figuring out ways to reinforce it. I don't know, years ago, they, they, they built a uh, big high-rise building in San Francisco. All of a sudden, it started sinking on them. So it started dropping about six inches per year. And that basically, the building is not allowed to be inhabited. So it's basically going to have to be torn down and built again if they do that. Now, so it is with our families. I mean, if we have weakness in our families, the family is going to collapse. If you want your family to survive the test of time, the fiery attacks of Satan and the storms of life, you need to make sure your family and your household is built upon a sure foundation. And of course, we can tell you right now that foundation is upon Christ. Foundation is upon God and his word. A foundation that we can depend on. And so you ask the question, is your family structure built upon the rock of God's word? God is our rock. He is our salvation. And we must recognize him as such and honor him as such. Now, we know every June the National Weather Service begins to encourage the residents of Florida and other Gulf Coast states along the eastern seaboard to begin making preparations in case a hurricane comes. And a lot of times they usually have a walkthrough uh, disaster drill with many agencies involved and they sit down and evaluate how they did so that when, when and if the, the hurricane comes, they can hopefully respond so that they can save lives and save as much property as possible. And they do this to alert us so that we can be ready if a storm should make landfall. And with those who live in those areas where it's possible, you wonder why they don't always have a supply at home. You know, whenever the, the news says, hey, there's a hurricane coming, guess what? Everybody runs down the store, they buy their water, they buy their flashlights and batteries and their other supplies, and, and, and the stores run out just real quick. I mean, they live in an area where it's going to happen. Why not be prepared all the time? And so some things just don't make sense. But the belief of the, all these agencies is that the more aware and prepared we are, the better the chances are that we will be able to survive the storm and no lives will be lost. 
there's some areas they know by experience that with a lot of rain, it's going to flood. So they tell people to evacuate those areas. If there's going to be a large storm surge, they tell people to evacuate those areas. And when people do, they survive. People that don't uh, follow the instructions of these organizations, they have this chance of losing their life. All right, so however, before there was a National Weather Service, Jesus Christ gave a warning and an encouragement to his followers about what we need to do to make sure our houses are ready and able to endure the storms of life. All right, the key to a sure foundation, Jesus says, is to listen to his words or the teachings of Christ, which come from God, and apply them. That's how we establish a sure foundation. So the question is the presence and power of God's word visible in your family? Does it really show? Or does your family, what you might show at church, do they see the same thing at home? So do you and the members of your household actively engage and interact with the Bible outside of Sunday worship? I mean, do you even go to Bible classes? Some people don't even take time to take their kids to Bible classes or go to Bible classes themselves. And it seems like the only education they might get might be from the Sunday sermon. And so that, that makes them very weak when it comes to a relationship with God, it makes them very weak. And Satan loves it that way. We just have to know that. So parents, do your children see you studying and meditating and applying God's word in your life daily? I mean, they should. I mean, for those who have seen that, it's uh, very encouraging. And sometimes uh, we don't see that. So what you're telling your kids is God's word isn't important to your life. It's what you're saying. And so sometimes do they hear you talking about the Bible in a positive way? Or maybe you speak speak of the Bible in a negative way. I mean, what are your kids here? I mean, what you're saying, what they're observing, they're, they're going to be taken into their hearts and that's how they're probably going to turn out. You can't tell your children, well, you gotta love God if you don't show it in your own life. I mean, most people are a product of their environment. If they've been accustomed and grown to seeing one thing, then making a change is gonna be extremely difficult. That's why the, the idea of abusive households, because they grew up in an abusive household, that's normal for them, and they continue doing abuse. And so, I mean, we just have to understand that. Say, so, children, do your parents and siblings see that the Word of God is an essential part of your life? I mean, do they teach you about God? Do they tell you to read the Bible stories? Do they tell the Bible stories to you? Things like that. And if we're gonna strengthen our marriages, our families, our households, and our own spiritual lives, we've gotta make sure we are listening to Christ daily and doing what he instructs us to do. Here's a problem in many households. One member of the household, they wanna serve God, but the other members of the household, they don't care. They don't try. And so they put a hindrance before the one who's trying to serve the Lord. And it's very difficult very few are able to really withstand and continue faithful. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 through 9 says, And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, as they shall be as frontals on your forehead, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I mean, the words that Moses gave the people needs to be on their heart. And we must all be able to teach them to our children and others. So I challenge you to read Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, over and over, and follow God's instructions for making God's word the foundation of your house. See, you need to incorporate time in God's word into the daily or weekly routine and fabric of your family. Yeah, we got a lot to do. We, we, we have um, work to go to, we have school to go to, we have 
hobbies to see too. We got to get the kids to soccer practice. Uh, we we got to do this, got to do that. Our favorite show comes on in 20 minutes. We just don't have time. Have you ever heard that? Absolutely, yeah. And, and a lot of people live their life in such a way as they demonstrate they don't take the time. We've got to make that time. We've got to make it in, in it the best way that we can. Reading scripture, reading something of a spiritual nature, listening to a uh, sermon online, something like that. That's what we need to do. And so we need to study God's word together and talk about it. We need to talk about it with our spouse, our children, and others who might be in our household. So discuss the sermons. If you do go to church, discuss the sermons and the Bible class lessons within your household and how they can be applied in our daily lives. I mean, if, if there's no application made from the sermon, it's basically a waste of time. Hopefully that's, that's what the preacher wants. He wants you to take what he says and apply it to yourself. And why? Because that's the way that you can get to heaven. But if you never take what the preacher says and think about it and discuss it and make it a part of your life, I mean, those are just empty words. And honestly, you have wasted your 20 or 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever. Actually, you probably wasted your whole day by going to church if you're not going to put these things into action. And so we need to discuss how we can apply these lessons to your own lives. And when the knowledge and application of the Word of God becomes the foundation upon which your family and house is built, and even though the storms of life will come, just like the wise man Jesus referred to in Matthew 7, 24, after the storm is over, your house will still be standing. A godly family rests upon a sure foundation. And this is just the beginning. You need to start with a foundation. Practically everything needs to start with a good, solid foundation. And if you don't have that foundation, whatever you try and build upon is basically going to collapse and will fail. So it takes time to develop a family unit. It also takes time to build upon that foundation. And the family needs to communicate the need for a uni unified foundation and one in which all the members of the family agree. It's got to be a collected effort. And so in the coming weeks and lessons and uh, months, we're going to talk about these things. We're going to learn to talk more about godly families in an ungodly world. So that, that's, our, that's our lesson. Just hope you take this to heart and that uh, you'll, you'll be able to benefit from it, that you'll be able to share it with others. And so uh, that's going to be our lesson for today. Consider those things and look for more lessons about raising a godly family in an ungodly world. And that'll be it for now. We're going to end the video. And if there's anything we can do to help you, just send us a comment. Send us an email or go to the website and ask questions. We'll be glad to answer them. Y'all have a good day. Good day now.